So the following uh, lecture will be the second class of the course in world philosophies. I did not record it either because I forgot or because my camera wasn't working. So uh, I don't have students in the class, unfortunately, because they usually come with comments and we usually start with their comments. But this lecture is going to be about Greek culture, ancient Greek culture. And the question is, why do we study it? Um, what is it about the Greeks that supposedly uh, we've inherited their legacy? And I can assure you, everybody disagrees on what that legacy is. So I'm just giving you my version of the story of the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in the era of globalization. So this is only part of the way I tell the story, but it's the first hour, hour and a half. Um, so supposedly the Greeks had democracy, but you have to start thinking about, well, what, what is it about Greek mythology? What's democratic about that? You know, it has all these gods raping women and goddesses. There's all this conflict. There's so much stuff going on. So what on earth does that have to do with democracy? So um, I will give you, um, why do we study the Greeks? Well, one reason is because around 800 BC in that area of the world, there was a huge leap forward in consciousness. This is not the only place in the world where it happened. It happened in many places. It happened in India, China, um, many other places I know that I don't know enough about. But it's a natural sort of evolution. So you had um, evolution from originally just living in families, extended families, tribes, more basic uh, social networks. And then uh, the social networks got more and more complex to the point where people, um, the, the human mind would look, cognize, observe, just like animals do. And then they reflect, they remember what they've observed. They can anticipate a predator or a prey, they can start to follow patterns. And the thing about the leap in consciousness, however, is that suddenly the mind thinks itself. You reflect on what it is you've been doing all this time. So um, you realize that, oh my God, I am engaged in pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is the cause of why we adapt so well, right? Why is it we're so successful at getting away from predators or finding prey because our pattern recognition? So suddenly there was this recognition that we are the creature with the capacity to do this in a world that's actually ordered and there are patterns out there. So this is the huge flourishing around 800 BC where all of a sudden in many different sectors of society, many different ways of communicating, people were trying to figure out patterns so that they could understand the natural world they live in and they could, to some extent, control it or adapt to it. And they could understand the cultural world. They could start to recognize patterns in human culture. And then they can start to recognize human behavior as motivated by internal drives. They could sort of internally reflect on those. And they could. Um, understand these patterns in a way that would educate themselves and each other about, well, which ways of 
living are more uh, positive, have a more positive um, consequences later down the line. So this is what happened. Um, the first one aspect of this was the pre-Socratic philosophers. So they decided that the natural world was ordered. So there was some single or combination, some ordering force that was foundational and everything else sort of uh, was a spin-off from that. So there was a foundation that the human mind was capable of understanding because it existed in an orderly way. All right, so there were disagreements among the pre-Socratics about what that most foundational power or reality was, but they all agreed there was something, uh, some ultimate um, meta, metaphysical entity or force. So um, Thales thought everything is water. So everything starts from water or is a, an offshoot from water. And at first, I remember when I read these excerpts, it would seem kind of silly or confusing. Um, but I did realize at some point that I, I personally speculated about stuff like that too. And I used to look at the chart, the elements in my science class and think it's so amazing that there's so much order in the natural world that you could actually make a chart like this. Um, Anyway, so that was the idea, is that this, the universe is ordered. And so Thales said water. Now, what he had in mind, I think, he was also a mathematician, was um, that the less sophisticated animals are in the water, and then the notion they come from water to land. Also, um, the notion that there was some kind of a a mix, you know, some kind of stew and lightning hit it. And that was a source of a new form of life. I'm not quite sure if that theory has been discredited, but that was another speculation. And then also um, when mammals are pregnant, they have a, a sack, right? So there's water. And, and so I was pregnant when I read Thales and I thought, oh yeah, that's right. That's what all pregnant women say. Ah, it's all water. I'll lose all this weight after the baby's born because it's all water. Um, so water was one of them. And Aximander said air is the most fundamental. And Pedicles had a kind of ecologist's argument that there's earth, air, fire, and water. There's the same amount of energy, the conservation of mass energy, but it takes on different forms, but it occurs according to a cycle. Democritus is the one who thought everything is made up of these tiniest little things. So Adam means the smallest thing. So now it would be the, whatever is considered the smallest thing, the quarks, if there's something smaller than quarks these days, and those are the people who try to look at reality um, from the starting point of the smallest particles or waves or whatever they are. And then Heraclitus said uh, fire, which is like energy. And the only law that doesn't change is the law of change. Everything else is changing all the time. So there was a physicist in the 20th century, um, Heisenberg. And he, he focused on the uncertainty principle that you don't know if something's a particle or a wave. And um, he agreed with Heraclitus and he said so. So it, the basic um, archetype, the basic foundation. Parmenides said all is one. Everything is just an offshoot of the overall one. And then um, Anaxagoras thought everything is mind or noose. There's a divine mind that's the ordering force behind um, what we see. Um, all right, so the pre-Socratics were off on the islands. 
that was one layer of this consciousness becoming conscious of itself. Another layer uh, was Hesiod's creation story. Hesiod was interested in human affairs and human relationships. And so he thought there were four forces, or, or originally chaos, and then eros is a creative force, thanatos is the destructive force, Gaia is the earth. And so this whole drama between positive and negative energy plays out on the earth. Um, and he gives a story about the origin of, uh, I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but it, it all has metaphorical um, meanings. It has lessons for human beings also. I guess I'll tell the one story that um, Gaia gave birth to Uranus, heaven. So we have heaven and earth, and they gave birth to mountains and hills and streams and volcanoes. And um, so there started to be a history. The earth wasn't just this clot of dirt going around the sun, okay? So it started to have change. So natural history started to happen. Well, when that happens, then there was a before and an after. It was before the volcano, after. So one of their offspring was Kronos, time. They also had an offspring that were monsters and they had five heads, and 10 arms. And Uranus didn't like these children uh, because he was uh, embarrassed by them, they're ugly, and he was threatened by them because they're powerful. Well, what? so he buried them in the earth. And so Gaia was not happy about this. And so she got a sickle and she was stood in front of all of her children and said, who's gonna cut off his genitals? I don't wanna produce anything else with this guy. Um, and Kronos said, I'll do it, mom. So he did it and he became king of the gods. All right. Then he himself got paranoid when he started having children and he devoured his children. He ate them. And his wife, concubine, was not happy about that. So she went back to the grandparents. Hey, could you help me uh, stop this guy? And of course, Uranus was thrilled with that because <laughs> what... Kronos, his son, did to him. So yeah, I'm, I'll be happy to cut him off, get to um, prevent him from doing this. So Zeus, so when Zeus was born, his mother wrapped a stone, um, a blanket around the stone and gave that to, to Kronos. And Zeus went off to Crete and got raised in a cave in Crete. So um, Kronos got tricked into um, taking an herb and throwing up, vomiting out his children. And then Zeus came and conquered him and became king of the gods. Okay. So what is this about metaphorically? They're literally, it's pretty gruesome. Metaphorically, it's about how the relation between fathers and sons, it's about natural evolution, and it's about cultural evolution. So it starts out natural evolution, and then um, Zeus is the god of justice, so that's interrelationships, and from there, um, Prometheus, and then humans, and then it just moves up, okay? So Hesiod described the birth of the 12 Olympian gods, and there's lots of stuff you could say, but, um, just one thing would be Uranus. Uh, what happens when a father, especially, could be a mother, gets their ego caught up in their children? So their little boy is going to be a chip off the old block. And the dad tells them, you know, you have to do this. You have to be this. You have to. He wants control of that kid. Um, but what happens if the kid is smarter than him and better looking than him and more athletic than him and is going to go farther than him. 
well, then he'll compete against his own kid. Or if the kid is uglier than him and less smart than him and less coordinated than him, then he's embarrassed by them. In both cases, it's complete, it's crippling. The, the child is crippled for no reason, right? They were just born with or without these various characteristics. And so they, so he cripples them, he harms them psychologically. Of course, the mother is very upset and she takes them under her wing, right? She buries them. And so again, they get stifled in their ability to be themselves. So I think that metaphorically, that's what it's about. And it's a cautionary tale it's saying, don't do this. You might be tempted to do this. Don't do this. Each child gets to follow their own sense of calling, their own skills. They have some certain interests, certain passions, and then they, they make a contribution to the well-being of the society based on what they can do and what they enjoy doing. All right, so the Olympian gods represent um, all the different sacred passions. So sacred passions is what I call when you're living for the sake of something greater than yourself. And um, there's 12 of them. And they're all based on the fact that we are social and political creatures by nature. In order to fulfill our nature, we need to live together in communities that are governed by a common set of laws. So living in a community of laws and institutions is higher order way of living. It, it forces us to think about things in a higher order level. We have to think about ourselves as citizens, as equal citizens living under a common body of laws. So we can't just live impulsively and we can't just live tribally and we can't just favor our own. We have to uh, agree among ourselves and create laws that apply to everyone. Um, so that's, that's why you get the sense of justice you get. And I will, I'll have another list of each one of those. Then uh, Homer, took the Olympian gods, he created a story, two different books about the two major tasks in human life. So the Iliad is about public life. The Odyssey is about private life. The Iliad is about aggression, um, power, and um, the Odyssey is about creativity, and nurturing, gentleness. So this animus is the forceful, uh, competitive, aggressive, assertive force in the psyche. And anima is the nurturing, gentle, creative force in the psyche. Okay, so um, the message is every Paris, it starts out with Paris's choice. And the stories are for this part of it as a young person has to decide what am I going to live for? What is going to be my ultimate goal? And every young person has to make this decision. And he had to choose between three different goddesses. And Aphrodite said, if you pick me, I'll give you pleasure and wealth. She was the goddess of beauty understood as physical beauty that stimulates male lust, okay? If you choose me, I'll give you the most beautiful woman in the world, and that's connected to money. Uh, because pleasure, sex, uh, sensuality, if that's your goal, you're going to have to make money to keep that going. Then Harris said, if you choose me, I'll give you power and along with that glory. So that's another goal you could have is that you want uh, to be popular or you want power. So you might have money, but not that much power, but you want power. So you wanna run an institution or you wanna run a government 
to want control over other people um, as your goal in life, right? That's always possible because people live in institutions that need to be managed by somebody. Um, and then the other choice, Athena said, if you choose me, um, I'll give you wisdom and justice. And um, so justice is rule for the sake of the ruled. So if you have money, you have power, you use it for the benefit of other people. And wisdom is knowing how to do that in all sorts of situations and understanding that this is the goal of human life because we live in a universe that's ordered. We're capable of understanding the order of the natural world. We're capable of understanding the order in human affairs. And if you act through the love of wisdom and justice, you will preserve or maintain or cultivate higher and higher levels of complexity, higher and higher levels of prosperity flourishing, human flourishing, and stability, at least most likely, unless something accidental happens, which it does. But you will know, you'll go to bed at night knowing you did the best you could to aim at that goal. So that was Paris's choice. Well, Paris made the wrong choice. He chose Aphrodite. He wanted the most beautiful woman in the world, who was Helen. She was already married, not surprisingly. So he went and visited um, the um, Argos, uh, Menelaus, who was married to Helen, and he abducted her, but she went willing, willingly. So Paris and Helen were insanely attracted to each other. Paris took her to Troy and, um, and the Trojans, his father accepted her and let her come in the city. The priests said, no, no, <laughs> don't do this. It'll start a war because they're gonna come. The Achaeans will come and get her. And, um, but the Trojans took a vote and they wanted to stand up to those Achaeans and they wanted to show them who's boss, all right? The Achaeans, on the other hand, they had the just cause. You can't go abducting people from another city-state when they visit. For example, if Michelle and Barack Obama went to Russia to see Putin and somebody abducted Michelle, I mean, you'd have trouble. You'd probably have a war. So this is definitely, they had the right cause. The trouble is Agamemnon uh, was live, sleeping with the daughter of the Oracle at Delphi, which is the most sacred site, which is the, the priests that give advice about justice and wisdom. So the priest came and he wanted his daughter back. And Agamemnon said, no. So it's clear that Agamemnon did not care about justice. He cared about power. And so he got into power struggles with everybody. And so now you have a tale of two cities based on the two wrong choices people can make. And within each city, there's every kind of dysfunction and perversion and all sorts of unnecessary suffering because they made that wrong ultimate choice. Okay, so that's the Iliad. <laughs> and then the Odyssey, by the end of the war, Odysseus clearly has PTSD. He's completely lost his soul. He forgot to um, worship at the shrine of Athena and thank her for the victory when she had been his mentor all along. So you can tell that he's, he's really lost it. Um, he's become brutalized by the war. So he has to, and he's also very proud and it costs him that's another great story, but so he has encounters with a number of different goddesses or women. So he has to flush through a whole lot of um, toxic attitudes toward women that men have that are archetypal. They just keep coming back. Women are not sex toys. 
Women are not witches. Women are not uh, temptresses. Women are not uh, flatterers, right? And so finally, after 10 years, so 10 years out battling the war, that's in the public sphere and it has to do with aggression. Um, 10 years heading back home, dealing with his inner life, his ability to love, right? His wife and have a family and nurture um, and having to go through all those types of dysfunction. So that's um, my idea of the basic gist of Homer. And then, um, and then the Greek myths, let's see, I'm going to, okay. I'm gonna to go to the Olympian gods. Um, each of them represents uh, one of the sacred passions. And there's a male and a female version. So um, justice is, Zeus is the god of justice. So this is the part of society that is government, obviously. It's people making laws, the legislative branch, people applying laws, the judiciary, judiciary people enforcing laws, that would be the executive. Um, and that can be done for the well being of the ruled, or it can be done power for its own sake, power to help your friends and harm your enemies. Those are all abuses of power. Um, and Zeus uh, makes his own set of mistakes because um, the gods represent uh, personifications of human beings in these positions and the gods represent complexes. They represent when people get fixated on their one thing and they ignore everything else. And when they um, abuse that particular sacred passion, they get it out of balance with all the others um, and they disrespect all the others. Human beings can't do that. Gods can. Right, they are the personification of when people have over bloated ideas of their own importance. Um, Athena is the goddess of justice and um, the arts and wisdom. So she actually is wiser than her father. And when he gets too angry, she tries to calm him down. She wants to advise him when he tries to take revenge when he sleeps with young women and creates all sorts of problems. Um, so she's the wisest of them all. Each one of these deities not only is fixated, they have their sacred passion, their eros, but they also have their dark side. And um, Athena's dark side is that she's so identified with her father that she cannot stand it if anyone is critical of him. She'll punish people who are critical of her daddy. <laughs> okay, there are women like that. Okay, Poseidon is the god of the sea. So Poseidon and Demeter represent these natural forces that are much greater than human beings. So human beings have to create a culture that's sustainable, that's re that respects these larger forces. And that's what we have not been doing, the human race. Uh, there's a very real possibility that we, life on earth is not going to survive. But I first got into this 50 years ago because I was aware that we're heading in the wrong direction because of our arrogance, because we were overstepping our bounds. And in the myths, Poseidon, if you overstep the bounds, he's the god of the sea. So you're going to have floods and he's the god of the winds or he commands the winds. You're going to have hurricanes. You're going to have floods. You're going to have, right, which we do and we will. Um, and then Demeter is the goddess of fertility, human fertility and the earth's fertility. And of course, we're screwing up there too and creating uh, deserts, desertification of certain parts of the earth. Uh, we're really destroying its natural cycles. 
And then uh, we are also, because plastic has neuroendocrine, has endocrine disruptors in it, um, we're um, sort of the decline in our own species is occurring because there's a 40% lower sperm count. If the sperm count is going down, there's all sorts of um, effects on the reproductive system, um, defects in um, genetic defects, other defects. So we are messing with the natural, the biosphere, and it is coming back. And, and we are going to take a hit in terms of um, the Earth's fertility and human fertility. Okay, Hades is the god of the underworld and Persephone is his consort. Um, so this, these are reminding you of what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind? Because your life, people will tell stories about you when you're gone. So what story do you want them to tell? Do you want your life to be a story that will serve as educational, as a guide, as an inspiration for other people? Or are you gonna tell a story that's a cautionary tale, right? Or are you just gonna go down without having really decided on anything and done something serious and important? Um, did you just fritter your life away on distractions? Or did you seek money or power? Because that's the story that you will leave behind. Um, Apollo is the god of reason, science, medicine, math, logic, um, the god of rhetoric, you know, knows how to create a good speech. Um, he also has very ordered music, not just any music. Um, and then his sister is Artemis, the goddess of the hunt and the wilderness. So Apollo, Apollonian reasoning leads to the building of cities. And uh, Artemis is the one outside in the wilderness. Um, Ares is the god of war. And so the god of honor and most men at that time were honored because of their behavior during a war. Nowadays, you could say that economic wars are, um, people are respected for winning the economic war. Um, the thing about Ares is that he had to be kept under control by his, his stepsister, Athena, because he just liked to go out there and be macho. And, and he had a double-edged edged sword. So he just went and brutalized at one point in the Trojan War. He just went out and killed people on both sides just to show everybody how machismo he was. And Athena got mad at him, Hera and Zeus. This is dishonorable. This is not honor. Um, and then his counterpart is his mother, Hera, the wife of Zeus. And she would be the the wife of the CEO or the wife of, you know, it used to be the president and all that, but she would do the charity balls. She would sit on the hospital board, the school board, the park board. She would sort of take care of having a high quality of life other than in addition to just having a set of laws and people doing, following the law or doing what their jobs require, whatever. This has to do with the quality of life. Um, Dionysus is the god of wine. Um, he's kind of the wild child. Uh, and he is the only god that dies and resurrects. And he's the god of the theater. Well, the theater tells stories about um, the gods and human beings being possessed by the gods. So overreacting, going to extremes, taking revenge. And so you're supposed to flush that desire out uh, by choice, right? It's not repressing the desire. It's saying, I don't really want that. And when you flush it out, then you have energy to pursue something that's really important. 
because you're not spending any energy repressing desires. You're just transforming them. You're getting rid of all the dark stuff. But it's a constant process. It's not like it's a one-time deal. Um, but that's what Dionysus represents. He dies and resurrects. He's the god of the theater. You go to the theater to die to a certain irrational type of behavior and then be reborn in the love of justice and wisdom. His counterpart is Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. And she's normally married to Hephaestus, the god of the forge. And so craftsmanship. And this is important because what it is, is we are sensuous creatures. The Greeks were not Puritans and they weren't Calvinists. They weren't anti-sensuous. The physical body is beautiful. The earth is beautiful. Natural is beautiful. And then cultural, you, you, your culture is a emergence of your nature. It's just a higher level of development of your nature. It's not split off from your nature. So human beings don't just eat out of minimal carved out, you know, tree trunks with a hole, you know, with carved out so you can have a bowl of soup. The human beings make pottery. They make beautiful things out of wood. They carve it, they craft it, they put decorations or they tell a story from their myths that gives you a life lesson. That everything has style, everything is balanced, symmetrical, and beautiful, right? Color, style. And that is very deeply satisfying to people. And um, it's a part of um, affirming and celebrating our natural, uh, our nature, but our nature is as cultural creatures, not just biological creatures. So Aphrodite is not supposed to be about just sex and um, sexual arousal and you know, having sex with another beautiful body. It's about creating a whole beautiful um, city and society. Okay, so that's the god of the forge. Hestia is the goddess of the heart. So she sits, her, her symbol is at the fireplace. This is where people start talking about life and where the light of the mind is first kindled and kept alive, you start reflecting on your life and realizing that that's what you're doing. You're reflecting on your reflecting and realizing, wow, this is what we have to do to be fully human. And then Hermes takes the torch. He takes that light and he goes out into the world and tries to shed light on human affairs, right? Tries to bring the light of the mind into the society. So um, yeah, there's lots more stories to tell, but that's what I would call spiritual humanism, which is it's our, our natural humanity is to live for the sake of something greater than ourselves. Some people, in some of the Greeks obviously took the stories literally that the, the gods lived up on Mount Olympus, right? And they were the cause behind the lightning and thunder and all that. But other wise people, the ones that wrote the stories, knew that these are just personifications of human psychic energies and the stories are trying to give you a healthy psyche, trying to help you flush out the crap, <laughs> the thanatos, the destructive impulses, so that you can liberate yourself for a very creative, flourishing kind of life that makes a big contribution to the next generation. Um, so those are the deities. Then they were there were nine muses. So the muses are the poets. And there are all the different ways that people recognize patterns and write stories or create music or create something that's trying to educate 
uh, people about how to live, how to flourish. So um, one was um, epic poetry, that's Homer, um, is one epic poet. Cleo was the um, muse of history. So um, historians like Thucydides wrote history, but with a view to a pattern. Thucydides watched as Athens or was part of the process where Athens lost its democracy. And he wants to tell that story for posterity. And he says that. I want people to learn from my story and not do what we did. Okay, it's just like Greek tragedy. Don't do this. So, so he he was possessed by the muse of history. Then there's um, a love poetry, right? Where when you tell poems or sing songs about sexual love, you civilize it, you tame it, you reflect on it, and you integrate it into the rest of your life. Um, then there's, um, let's see, lyric poet music, right? And a lot of these stories were told while people were playing music. The stories were in iambic pentameter because you could remember them better. So this is an oral culture. So in order to get people to actually remember the stories, they had to have a rhythm, they had to have music. Um, to, to stimulate as much of the psyche as you could so it would stick. <laughs> and then the stories, you're intended to go through life, but when you find yourself in a critical situation, you will recall that story. Oh my God, this is just like um, uh, Hecuba taking revenge. I don't wanna do this. I get it. I know what she feels like. I never thought I would feel what Hecuba feels. All of a sudden I'm in the situation, but she made a mistake, right? She took revenge, everybody suffered for it. So I have to avoid doing that. Flush it out. <laughs> um, all right, so this one is uh, religious hymns. So religious music, I think you can tell, although it's there's a variety of it, but the overall message is to use music to have a awareness of higher powers, however you define them. Um, you can have Benedictine chant, you can have um, gospel, African-American gospel music, and then Charles Wesley hymns. I mean, there's lots of different types, but they're all intended to be worship or recognition of higher powers. Um, Tragedy is another kind of pattern recognition intended to educate um, dance and um, comedy, and then um, astronomy and astrology. So looking at the universe, patterns in the universe, and with astrology, it was also um, how your psyche, right? Um, how your emotions, your general life trajectory is affected by the motions of the stars. Um, so the, let's see now, what happened? We had this culture. So now I'm playing the role of Plato. So my name is Plato. I, the word, fits with a kind of tree that had leaves that were broad, right? So either I was the broad-shouldered one and I was a, a wrestler, which I was, I was an athlete, or it could also have meant fat so, and that just meant I spent too much time uh, in, in my books at <laughs> academic things. But anyway, you can call me whatever you want. Um, so I just happened to grow up at a time in a city, the city state of Athens. And I, um, I try not to be a cultural bigot, right? Uh, people love their city state because it's mine, right? And they're patriotic and they're blindly patriotic. But I just felt lucky that I was born into Athens because I do think Athens had the best 
culture of any of the city states. Um, and also my uncle Solon was considered the main author of the constitution of Athens, which of course is a source of great pride. And he was considered a great state, great at statecraft because statecraft consists of weaving together the rich and the poor, creating a body of laws, institutions, habits, a way of life that would weave together the rich and the poor and create a strong and stable middle class because you don't have a flourishing society unless you have a strong and stable middle class. And the Greek city-states were always in a state of disruption because of this war between the rich and the poor. So if the rich used their advantage to exploit the poor, eventually the poor would resent it and they'd have a rebellion. Well, they'd end up killing off all the brains uh, that they needed to operate the city. So when they took over power, they weren't very good at it. So then the rich could, could take advantage of them again. And Solon just wanted to stop to, an end to it, right? So he wanted to develop a constitution that would um, reward working together where people could recognize that you're, everyone's gonna be a lot happier if you just get along and help each other. Um, so these are, this was also a transition from merely family units where children, the goal of that is just to get a kid raised to adulthood so that they can keep the cycle going. Then there's villages, which are based on people coming together to live more efficiently. So there's a division of labor, but the highest level is political community where people come together under a common body of laws and they want to have some leisure time. Life is not just about survival, even efficient survival. It's about a quality of life. And so this is where they, you have creativity, the arts, people educating each other, people thinking about citizenship, people um, thinking about how to maintain a strong and stable middle class, people expected to participate in civic life so that in a, a way that does preserve a middle class and they leave that legacy behind that they pass to their children a society that was as stable or, or more so than they had been given to them. So the legacy of a flourishing city is the most important legacy you could pass on to your children. Um, plus, you know, intellectual activity, speculation about the universe, just for its own sake, right? Not to get rich, not to get powerful, just, just to learn, just to know for the sake of knowing. So scientific speculation, advancements in medicine, um, technology, Apollonian powers can be used to develop higher levels of technology to meet our basic needs better. Um, our free artistic creativity, free scientific inquiry, citizen engagement in public life, all of those things are political community or political community makes possible. That is the good life. And I agreed with that. And um, I left my city state for that reason. And a political genius is somebody who can think about the whole system and how it needs to all work together to cultivate a strong, a flourishing life for as many citizens as possible. So laws and institutions, um, criminal justice system, um, avoid uh, confront unnecessary confrontations with other countries for to try and gain wealth or power, educational system that promotes opportunities for citizens to develop themselves, their intellect, their talents. Um, you reward people who show that they can use their talents to benefit other people. Uh, informal system of education, the marketplace. All right. 
So now I'm going to show you how the city was set up so that people were constantly being reminded of what the ultimate values of their city state was, were. So here you have the temple to Athena, goddess of wisdom and justice. And so her shadow is cast all over the city. Anywhere you are, you can look up and be reminded that you should be pursuing wisdom and justice, just like Paris should have. And when he didn't, or when Agamemnon didn't, all those stories of destruction, if you make one of those other choices. Um, so here's the biological. This is where the family is. And then as you walk up toward the temple, here's the, the theater is on the side of the uh, Acropolis, the hill. And that's where you go to flush out all those emotions that block you from being able to make good judgments as a citizen. Um, uh, the tragedies would be about uh, father complexes, mother complexes, superiority complex, inferiority complex. Um, that, and that happens when, for example, um, some little boy's mom doesn't think their dad makes enough money. And she complains the whole time he's growing up that he's not rich enough or powerful enough. Well, that just sets up the little boy. Okay, I'm going to beat out my dad and I'm going to please my mother, right? So he loves his mother. He's competing against his dad. Well, a young man or an adult who's still got that complex is gonna be a terrible boss. He will do anything for money because he's still competing against his dad in his mind. And so everybody, wherever, whoever's around him has to deal with his psychic imbalances and it hurts the society, doesn't make good judgments. So that's what all those plays are about, like get over that and see yourself for who you are, um, pursue rule for the sake of the rule and take pride in that. So also the, the way the temple is built, the roof of the temple follows the same line as the hills. That's because this temple is just a natural development of human beings. Human beings are fulfilling their nature by building cities. Cities are not built as supernatural, as anti-natural. They're just the natural development of a certain kind of species. So just like a squirrel has to have an oak tree to uh, hibernate in, right? Or a bear needs a cave. Human beings need cities. Um, all right. So then the next is, um, if you see a medieval cathedral, it's built right in the middle of the city at ground level. It's noisy, it's dirty, it's ugly. There's all sorts of sin, right? That's this world full of sin. And then you step into that cathedral and it is a rocket ship to heaven. So it's always reminding you the whole point of life is to be a good, good person so you can go to heaven, right? Get rid of this awful world. And it's quiet. You have chanting. You have incense. You have the rosary. You have the light coming down. So visual hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching. You eat the wafer, wafer and drink the wine. So it's a whole complete five senses engaged in getting your head out of this world. That is not the Greek. <laughs> the Greeks have uh, these steps that are shallow steps, right? They're not hard to get to. And you go from your biological self to your social self and flush out the garbage <laughs> from your psyche so you can be a good friend uh, citizen. Then you go to your political self 
Well, you're, you become engaged in political life. It's a slow process. Um, then there, the sculpture or the architecture focuses on beauty and proportionality because that's natural. The columns are built out of proportion so that they will look proportionate from the point of view of a human being. Um, and right next to the Temple of Athena is a um, courtroom. And so what you're supposed to think is that Athena gave us this power to govern ourselves. And we have to think about, she has let her inspire us, but in the end of the day, we have to take responsibility for governing ourselves and for the decisions that we make, right? We can't blame her. She gave us the power. We take responsibility for what we do with it. So there's the courthouse. There's the theater on the side of the hill. Uh, the Olympic Stadium. Okay, so every four years, the, the games were held at a different city state, but the biggest ones were in Olympia. But the philosophy there was uh, that every city state needed young men who were strong in their upper body strength. So they had to maintain their strength in case there was a war. But you could do that by having military school where you teach people blind obedience to their city state and they're willing to protect it at any cost and, and they're bigots, they're cultural bigots, we're the best. Or the Olympics is where you keep young men strong, but you do it through these contests where everybody has to follow the rule of law. So the city states come together, they create a community based on the rule of law, just like a de democratic society. So this was way before Athens. The culture was emphasizing this coming together and deliberating about public affairs, creating laws, applying laws, enforcing the laws, and also making friendship bonds with people in other city states so that you will be less likely to go to war against them because you know them and you know you're, you're a lot like them. So a young athlete in one city state recognizes his soulmate in another one. And the coaches and the trainers and you know everybody is um, bonding with each other. This is the temple to Hephaestus, the god of the forge. And the view from that temple is down on the marketplace. So when you, on Saturdays or the market day, people came from the rural areas into Athens to buy stuff and trade stuff. But uh, they would look up and the shadow of Hephaestus would remind them, you should have well-crafted things, not cheap things. Um, you should make the things you sell beautiful and meaningful. Whereas the shadow of Athena was, and you should sell for a just price. You should be honest. You should be fair. And if you're not, you'll get punished by the law. But you should want the rule of law. You should want regulation so that everyone can flourish. The other um, function of the marketplace is that goods that were sold here were uh, acquired from all over the area from many different city states. So everybody got the latest, you know, trendy thing from Troy or from Cyprus or whatever. And the idea there was you'd have trade agreements with other city states. That would be another way to maintain peace is because it would cost you something if you went to war with these people. Um, your, your own citizens would suffer in terms of economics. Um, all right, so the Athenians had the best ships. So when it came to war, they had the best Navy because they already had this huge fleet of ships. They knew how to make good ships. 
Um, Poseidon is the god of the sea down at the end of the peninsula there. He's overlooking the sea. Zeus is the god of the thunderbolts. Um, and then on the there's the port, the Piraeus, but the first island you get to is, um, uh, oh, geez, it starts with an A. But anyway, that's where the, the site for women's health is. And um, a, a temple and a site dedicated to Aspasia, who was the goddess of health, the daughter of um, Apollo's son, the god of healing. Um, all right, so that's a beautiful site. Um, and then the islands, this is where the different pre-Socratics uh, had little communities because once they decided the universe was a certain way, they started, they wanted to set up a way of life where that basic intuition about the universe would be preserved and would drive, be the driving force behind their way of life is that they imitated the universe. Um, all right, and lots of dialogue. What is beauty? What is truth? You had to keep the questions going. Um, and then Corinth, Delphi, I don't, I can't explain everything, but here's the killer. Okay, so Hygieia is uh, health, body, mind, and spirit, right? Okay, then we corrupted it. And this is what really breaks my heart. We had, we had it all. And our founders, the people who set up the institutions, the development over time, my uncle so went, oh my God. But in my lifetime, within 30 years, we completely destroyed it. We went from defeating the Persians when we were outnumbered eight to one to um, destroying ourselves, losing a war, becoming totally overextended, um, and then electing a man who became a dictator, all in the name of a return to traditional Athenian values of loyalty to family, blind patriotism and blind uh, belief in the city's gods. This was exactly what Athens was not. Athens was trying to cultivate critical thinking. They were trying to teach you not to favor your family over citizenship, not to protect your family if they broke a law. Everybody should be subject to the law. It's not protect your family because then you don't have the rule of law. Everybody's got family members. Anyway, so putting family first is anti-democratic putting your country first, like you can't do any wrong. That's anti-democratic because the laws should be based on natural justice, universal ideas of justice. And so your city and your leaders are accountable to that and they can make mistakes. So you shouldn't be blindly patriotic. And then allegiance to the city's gods is also anti-democratic Everybody should be able to critically examine the religious tradition so that they don't blindly think that they're, they don't become arrogant. They think they're pious or holy when they're not. And the politicians can really take advantage of it and use God to cover up their real ambitions, which is power and money. So so we corrupted our city. Now, how did we do that? Um, and that's, I'll tell you the story of how we did that. And uh, it just grieves me to think of what we had and what we lost, which is why I started my school, the academy, to try and uh, tell stories, write dialogues uh, that are cautionary tales. How did we lose our democracy? Well, here, Socrates talking to Euthyphro, Socrates defending his way of life and getting killed for it, Socrates talking to the educators, Socrates talking to the 
military leaders. Socrates talking to the political leaders. Socrates talking to the artisans, right? And finding out how they thought, their way of life. Every one of them was taking advantage of the city. They were not acting like citizens. They were aiming for power, wealth, glory. They were taking the freedom that they were given and exploiting it and corrupting it. They were a bunch of mini tyrants. And so of course the city got unstable and eventually a very power driven man who was another uncle of mine, Critias, said, okay, I'm gonna fix this, right? We gotta get back to traditional values. The young people are not respecting their elders uh, those liberals are unpatriotic um, and they don't believe in the city's God. So we have to believe in religion, this, our religion. We have to believe in ourselves and um, vote for me and I'll bring us back to law and order. And so he did and he started killing off his political opponents and um, killing off foreigners, uh, really a bloodbath a reign of terror, and that lasted for nine months, and the Democrats took over again, and then they ended up killing my great teacher, the best person in Athens. Um, so how do we do that? Well, first of all, uh, the Persians attacked us. Those are actually Iranians nowadays, but they had this one demigod leader everybody had to worship the leader and we we really thought we had a more advanced culture than that and i think we did too but we were outnumbered but we used our brains we strategized and we won and that was a huge celebration it wasn't just a power struggle it was a triumph of civilization it was a triumph of the more advanced the superior cultural tradition all right but then as soon as the Persians left, even before they left, two city-states became the most powerful, Sparta and Athens. And Athens was the place of the free and open society and all the arts and all the trade and all the openness and all the foreigners coming in and out and immigration, emigration, you name it, it's free and open. Over here, the Spartans were a closed society, a military society, no immigration, no emigration, a bunch of 80 year old buzzards made all the rules and applied them. Everybody had to prove himself as a soldier, a general, and then he could be a leader. Everything was dedicated toward victory in war and patriotism. And so, what did the Spartans think of the Athenians? Self-indulgent, sex fiends, no discipline, no loyalty, unpatriotic, uh, just degenerates, right? What did the Athenians think of the Spartans? Oh my God, a bunch of emotionally repressed, mindless, blindly obedient, can't see their past their own nose, you know, uncreative uh, buzzards, right? We don't have anything to do with. They're brutal. They're primitive. We're way more sophisticated than them. Okay, so, <laughs> so they hated each other culturally. They had a culture war, but underneath that, uh, the other city states just said, you guys, you go kill yourselves, leave us alone. No way, Jose, were they going to do that? So they made these power blocks and you had to belong to either the Delian League with Athens or the other league with Sparta. Like you had to pick sides. And most of those city states didn't want to pick sides. They wanted to be left alone, but there wasn't any way. So Athens, at one point with the, the, the island of Melos, Athens supposedly was saving the world for democracy, and you're either for us or against us. So the, the citizens of Melos decided, whoever comes, we're going to say, get out of here. 
we want to be left alone. Whether it's Sparta or Athens. Well, the Athenians arrived and said, look, you have to uh, come with us. You have to become part of our league because if you don't, then either the Spartans will make you part of their league or they'll think we're too weak and they'll come after us at home. So you must join. And the Malians said, no. And the Athenians massacred their men and um, enslaved them and just completely desecrated their people. And so some of the young people were saying, this is making the world safe for democracy. What's democratic about that? And then in order to build their great monuments to democracy, they taxed their allies. So the allies didn't have enough money to have a flourishing society. And they used the spoils of war from their enemies and you're not supposed to use the spoils of war for your own aggrandizement because then you'll have more wars because wars will turn into wars for money. And, um, but that's what the Athenians did. And they started acting, they started forming their Delian League. They modeled it after the Persians. <laughs> oh my God, those were those horrible people. They had just, uh, beaten up on, right? Uh, now they're modeling themselves after them. Um, what's happening with justice? The decisions are being corrupted by the love of power and the love of money. Um, let's see, the, the courthouse, the courts are getting corrupted because foreigners are coming in to teach the best and the brightest. They charge a lot of money, you have to be rich but your son will learn how to speak persuasively. And so he can go into a court of law and defend himself and get the jury to vote with him, or he can hire somebody and you can become a highly paid lawyer, defense lawyer that can manipulate a jury. You will, the same skill will enable you to go into the assembly and stand before the citizens and persuade them to do whatever it is you happen to want them to do. So you will have power and money. That's all they cared about. So the whole legal system was corrupted. The whole assembly of citizens, it was set up for people to learn how to be objective and rational. But the art of persuasion was always appealing to irrational emotions fantasies, phobias, pleasures, fears, um, anecdotal evidence, character assassination, post hoc propter hoc, correlation rather than causation. I mean, every logic book, every chapter has, you know, dozens of fallacies and those were taught as part of the skill of persuasion. So the, the, minds, the souls of the Athenians were corrupted, but they didn't even think of it as corruption. They just thought, well, I'm free. I'm free to pay whoever I want to educate my son, and I'm free to give him whatever kind of education he wants or I want him to have. Like, what are you, some kind of a dictator to tell me I shouldn't do this? Uh, everybody's free, but Socrates was trying to tell them, you're not going to stay free very long because you're destroying your system. Um, the tragedies, people weren't getting the message. They were thinking that Zeus was a good role model. These, <laughs> the stories of, of the gods with their fixation were actually just describing people. And it was perfectly fine to be that way. People just are this way. They just take revenge. They just uh, want to have sex with young girls. They, this is just life. This is realism. No, all the poets had a faith in human being that they could get educated and they could grow out of that and choose to promote human flourishing. But that's not the way it was getting understood. It was that Homer feeds these irrational desires and it's sort of naughty to watch this stuff.
but I kind of like it anyway, and it justifies my behavior. Um, the Olympics became this huge um, drinking party where the spectators were kind of couch potatoes who came for one big party. And then the participants were way over specialized. They weren't even that healthy. The idea was just a sound mind and a sound body, the amateur athlete. But it got specialized to the point where they had such a rigid regimen they had to follow in order to maximize their capacity that they weren't even that healthy. Um, the temple to Hephaestus, all of a sudden Hephaestus has to use all of his talents to make swords and shields because it's just war after war. Then the marketplace was corrupted because um, the economic treaties got more and more unfair and created animosity. And then also um, goods and services were sold from other city states. And, you know, people would notice, oh, they have different gods there and it's all relative. So what they learned was moral relativism. There's no one right and wrong. Everybody just has different opinions. Um, the temple of Poseidon. So now Poseidon is watching. Poseidon could see as the ships went out to battle against the Persians, which was a just war because the Greeks had been attacked by the Persians. The Persians were trying to create an empire and the Greeks fought back. But now the Greeks are the empire builders and they're killing each other and they're trying to each, each of those two city-states wants dominance, right? And they're forcing all the others. So all of a sudden, it's a very um, authoritarian, power-driven um, culture. Then Zeus, okay, so what happens as things start to fall apart? In order to gain stability, people say, oh, we've got to get back to traditional religion, right? So now all of a sudden, everybody has to believe Zeus is the cause of the thunderbolt, not, and those natural speculative philosophers, the pre-Socratics, they're a bunch of atheists. And so, and, you know, so, and then the women's health. Well, a lot of women came there because they were abused not just to get help with their menstrual problems or their pregnancies or something. They came to escape abuse too. So, and then the islands, one of the reasons the speculative philosophers went to islands was so they wouldn't get killed back in Athens because they did look for a natural foundation. They were not literalists when it came to the myths. So all of a sudden, um, everything starts to fall apart. And Socrates is the citizen that goes out and asks people questions and tries to get people to be accountable for the power that the public has entrusted them with. If you're called, if you're a political leader, you should be able to answer what is justice. If you're a military leader, you should be able to answer what is courage. If you're a religious leader, what is righteousness? If right, that makes sense, but people couldn't answer him. And then when there were young people, especially listening, and they saw their authority figures were ignorant or arrogant, wouldn't admit they didn't know, um, they, got, they got rebellious. And so, of course, Socrates got accused of corrupting the youth instead of those in power thinking, geez, uh, I got to study this more. I, I need to think harder about this. Nope. Socrates got sent to prison. He was killed, and he was killed by people who had returned to the democracy. They, he wasn't killed. He would have been killed, he said, by the oligarchs, by the authoritarian, the right-wing authoritarians, um, except that they got overthrown too quickly. 
So the Democrats came in and the Democrats killed him. <laughs> so here he is, the best citizen, the only honest person in Athens, the one who's really doing what a good citizen should do is hold their leaders accountable. And he, he gets killed by everybody. So he gets the hemlock and there's some hemlock. Um, and I did take six trips, six times I took students to Greece, which was fun. So here it is, we have dialogues. So I think Plato sent, gave us his stories, his, his dialogues, so that we would have dialogues about how they lost their stable society. Even if you're a monarch or an aristocrat, you should always rule for the sake of the rules. And if you don't, you're gonna lose stability and everybody's gonna suffer. So Plato wants us to compare our societies with his society and what's similar, what's different, what lessons can we learn? What mistakes can we avoid? Um, and so the sunset on a beautiful vision, right? Can we keep this vision of a flourishing society alive? And can we work for, toward it? Or are we too going to lose it? Um, just like Athens did. So that is the main lesson of today. And um, let's see. All right, so the next day we, so just to lead into where you're going next is this is a dialogue where Socrates is talking to a religious leader about what is piety? What does it mean to be holy or righteous? So before you read the dialogue, you should ask yourself, do you ever use the word religious? Somebody is religious. Well, what does that mean? Is it positive or negative? Um, what would you look for in a good religious leader? Um, so I think that's enough. Um, it's a long lecture. I don't, I lost track of how long, but I look forward to seeing all of you in class. And um, you can always come to me during office hours if you want to talk more, if you have questions. But you should look at how the posts work, the assignments work. And um, for each class, you read and you write your reactions, what you learned from the class, and your final takeaway. So you're constantly writing a paper. Your final paper is, what is my worldview? You wrote on that after the first day of class. What is my worldview? You wrote 200 words that should have been prepared by the, the time this class was held. And then every lecture we have, every comment other students make, you decide each day, do I, would I want to include that? Perhaps in my final worldview, do I like the lesson for today? I want that to be part of how I look at things or not, and then why? And so over the semester, you just keep adding and then it might get pretty long. So you'll have to sort of take the ultimate, um, the real high points of the class, formulate them into your final paper. Okay, thank you. I'll see you in um, a few days.